So when you leverage the real estate, when you take advantage of this powerful tool, where, like Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and I shall move the entire world. When you take advantage of leverage, you take that 11% return that seems kind of modest. It even underperformed small cap stocks, only did 1% better than the Dow Jones. And you multiply times five. And you now have, just very simply, a 55% return on investment because you have a five to one leverage ratio. So is everybody amazing? What an amazing weekend. Everybody keeps asking me, you know, which ASM are you in? And I'm like, I'm not in any ASM. Is that a cult? <laughs> it's a great cult. Uh, but I, I mean, it has just been such an education and such a pleasure to be hanging out with all of you all weekend. I mean, I have learned so much. I cannot believe the kind of success in this room. It is truly amazing. I mean, look at the opportunity that Jason and Matt have given people. Look at your success. Give yourselves a huge hand. Incredible, incredible. So, uh, like Jason and Matt said, I want to talk to you about income property, the most historically proven asset class in the world. But before we do that, I want to get into this topic of, you know, I was kind of thinking, and, and I do a lot of interviews on other people's podcasts and talking on my own podcast, about what is the sort of the one trick, the hack, the secret that really empowers people to success. And I think at the end of the day, it's leverage. It's leverage. Getting leverage over whatever it is you want to do, because leverage helps you do more with less. Whatever, whatever you do, leverage magnifies your results. And um, it's interesting because did anybody see USA Today, the weekend edition here? Yeah, amazing, huh? Right on the front page, it says five companies grab 70% of online dollars. And of course, the number one of those five is Amazon. And that's all you guys. I mean, it, it's, an, it's an incredible time to be alive. It's, it's truly amazing. I mean, think about it. Think about if you look at throughout history, you know, we have this situation where there were so many gatekeepers where you didn't have access. Nowadays, you have access. I call it the democratization of everything. Everything has become democratic. You know, you've heard of that book title, The World is Flat, right? And uh, this flattening of the world creates so much opportunity for all of us. I mean, 20 years ago, all of the products that consumers bought were decided upon by stuffy executives in boardrooms in big consumer products companies. Now, it's you. I mean, you're deciding what products impact people's lives. It's, it's just, it's, I say it on my podcast all the time, it's an amazing time to be alive. Say that with me. It's an amazing time to be alive. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing is, I didn't even connect that saying to Amazing.com, our host, until Friday. I was sitting in the audience and I was thinking, here I'm at Amazing.com, and I always say, it's an amazing time to be alive on my shows. So we have this democratization of literally everything where the gatekeepers have gone away. Think about history for a moment. Think about the history of something I call access. Access was always controlled by gatekeepers. If you had something to say, if you had an idea, if you had an opinion, if you had a cause, you had to go to some book publisher and some literary agent would vet you and some publisher would decide whether or not your ideas get published. Uh, you had a manuscript and they'd, they'd look at it and they'd sit on it for two years and then they'd change the title and re-edit the whole meaning of it. Now you can go direct to the marketplace, and the marketplace will decide whether or not it likes your ideas. I remember when I published my first book, uh, by the way, I'm author of 11 books, and they are all on the New York Times worst seller list. <laughs> 
Oddly, I'm not very into book publishing. I like podcasting much better. Writing a book is hard. Podcasting and just talking about stuff, much easier, at least for me. But I remember when I published my first book in 1999, it was called Become the Brand of Choice, How to Earn Millions Through Relationship Marketing. And I remember it was about midnight, and I had a, a sort of a, what's called a subsidy publisher. They may not call them that anymore nowadays. But uh, it was where you, you didn't have, it wasn't like Random House or one of these big publishers. It was a publisher that sort of helped you publish, uh, although you weren't completely self-publishing. So part of my part in this was I was responsible for putting the book on Amazon.com. And I remember back in 1999, on a weeknight, at about midnight, I listed my book on Amazon. And I thought, after I got done, it took about seven minutes to do that. And I thought, this is incredible. I literally took my ideas and I put them out to the whole planet Earth. The whole human race had access to them in seven minutes. And no one, there was no gatekeeper at all. You can go direct to the marketplace. So the history of access. Well, in, in the old days, you know, access was determined by pharaohs and kings and queens and religious leaders and churches. And then it was determined by governments, and unfortunately in some places it's still determined by some governments. Uh, and, and, and then you could easily argue that over the last century it was largely determined by corporations. But now, since we have the democratization of everything, there's no gatekeeper. It's determined by you. One of the many guests I've had in the 3,000 or so podcast episodes I've published uh, is, uh, is a guy named James Altucher. And he wrote a book that has such a great title. It's called Choose Yourself. Choose Yourself. And it just talks about this concept of how nobody decides where you are in the world except you. We have the, the most significant level of social and economic mobility the human race has ever known today. This is it. It's an amazing time to be alive. It is an amazing time to be alive. So that gatekeeper subject is something that I want to talk about today. But um, in addition to that, leverage. Let's go back to the topic of leverage. And let's look at this great quote by Archimedes. Now, about 2,300 years ago, the uh, philosopher and mathematician and physicist Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and I shall move the entire world. And this is the power of leverage. It's an incredibly powerful thing. And today, I want to touch on two areas of leverage but three total, one area that I want to spend the most time on, which is Matt and Jason said, is my specialty. It's income property investing. And uh, so as we do that, we're going to talk about these three areas, your business, your biology, and your investments. And, you know, you've heard for the past three days some of the greatest information on business ever. And there is no way I'm going to try and compete with that. I'm just going to share one of my business things with you, and I'm going to talk a little bit about podcasting and the success I've had with that and how it relates to my real estate investment company. And then uh, talk a little bit about biology, and then, of course, income property or real estate investing as my main topic. So this is what I call the triad of leverage. I think it's, these are really the three most significant areas of life. And, you know, someone might say, well, you know, what about relationships? That's a huge area of life. Well, that's part of biology. And, uh, and so that topic goes deep. It goes into the quantified self movement. It goes into all of the amazing, incredible technologies uh, that we have access to today. So as we dive into that, uh, I think it's important that I kind of tell you my own rags to riches story. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. How many people are from L.A.? A lot of people, yeah. L.A. people. You like traffic? Great, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in L.A. I lived in Orange County as an adult. I moved to Phoenix in 2011. And then very oddly, yeah, I really like Phoenix, by the way. That was a very, like, Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona, very easy place to live, not a traffic problem. It's very convenient. But, um... Oddly, I might hold a Guinness World Record. 
<laughs> for this one. I had to move back to California for a tax break. I don't know that anybody's ever done that, ever. <laughs> so call the Guinness World Record book. And I got to live in California for six months and a day to get my tax break. So I moved uh, just in June to La Jolla, California in San Diego. Any San Diegans here? We had Sean on stage, he's from San Diego. Yeah, San Diego's a great town, I really like it, but a lot of traffic in San Diego too. Uh, so anyway, back to Los Angeles and the rags to riches thing. So I grew up, you know, on the poor side uh, and uh, didn't have access to a lot of things. And I always, uh, saw, I went to an integrated school, an integrated public school, and if you don't know what integration is, that means where they bus everybody in and mix everybody up, you know. And uh, I, I saw some very wealthy kids at my school uh, that lived in an area called Cheviot Hills, and some of them actually lived in Beverly Hills, you know, 90210. And, uh, and then some lived in very poor areas, and I was kind of on the lower side of that spectrum uh, where I lived. And I always thought, you know, it seems like all the kids with money just have a little bit better life. You know, they have a little more freedom. They get to do fun things. You know, they were always going to Mammoth and going skiing for the weekend and, you know, had cool stuff. When it came time to drive, they had really cool cars. My first car cost $700. <laughs> I bought it used, of course. And um, so I got interested in this concept of money at a very young age. And I, uh, I had a Vans shoebox. I, uh, I spent a lot of my childhood skateboarding, and uh, this Vans shoebox, you know, Vans shoes, you know these shoes, right? Okay, they still have Vans shoes. Okay, yeah, they do. Uh, so I had this Vans shoebox, and I started sending away, uh, in magazines I would see ads. One of my favorite magazines was Popular Science, and another one was Success Magazine, but I don't think that's the same as the Success Magazine today. It, May or may not be, I'm not sure. And I would see all of these ads and, uh, you know, classified ads and display ads in these magazines. And this was before Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> Al Gore is a joke. But okay, <laughs> don't get mad at me. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, so. I, I, would, I would send away, and I kept all these, I kept a roll of stamps in my Vans shoebox and a big stack of envelopes, and one of those, you know, what do they call them, like a licky thing, you know, uh, where you fill it with water and you lick the envelope so you, uh, you didn't have to do it with your tongue. And so I would go to Winchell's Donuts, okay, at night before my mom got home because she would work two jobs and got home late. And this is actually the same Winchell's. It's still there. I found it on Google Maps literally yesterday or, or on Google Street View. And I would go to this Winchell's on the corner of Westwood Boulevard and National Boulevard in L.A. And I would sit there and I would do all my mailings and I would inquire about all of these offers. And, uh, you know, I remember there was w this one company called Rare Earth Real Estate that sold islands. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to own an island? That would be really swank, right? And uh, so there were, I remember this one thing I, I, I really agonized over. It was called the Wealth Kit. And, you know, this is like the early days of direct response marketing, right? And so the Wealth Kit was $19.95. And I literally kind of agonized over, you know, saving up for this. I started working when I was 14 years old. And um, I finally decided I'd send away for the wealth kit. The, uh, the ad was so compelling. It said, it's 1995, but unless you make at least $5,000 from the wealth kit, you don't have to pay me $39.95. <laughs> How's that sound for an internet marketer's author, offer, right? It's just like it, not much has changed with human nature, has it? And so I sent away for the wealth kit, and I remember I would go to Winchell's, and I would read that thing at night, and, you know, all of these ideas in there from subdividing land to, you know, opening businesses to just everything you could think of. It really opened my eyes about a lot of stuff. And uh, so that's what I uh, would do when I wasn't out skateboarding and hanging out with friends. And um, it really inspired me. Now, uh, years later, I saw a... Uh, an infomercial for a real estate guru. I was 16 years old at this point, and I saw this infomercial, 
And the, the guru was talking about how he bought all these houses with no money down. You've heard, heard of this concept, I'm sure. Whenever you can't sleep, you have insomnia, you're up late watching these things. And um, so I, uh, I got his book, and I read three chapters of the book, put it down, and my mom picked it up and read the rest. I was only 16, you know, I didn't finish much at that age. <laughs> and, uh, and so I put the book down, mom read the rest. Two years later, I'm 18 years old, I'm about to graduate from high school, and my mom goes, you know, Jason, you got me interested in this real estate stuff. There's a big seminar in Anaheim by Disneyland this weekend, why don't you go? And I thought, okay, so at that age, I, I couldn't do anything by myself. So I rounded up nine of my buddies from high school, and I got them all to go. And Friday night, the first speaker is up there, and he's talking about points. And I'm like, what are points? He's talking about loan points, you know, when you finance a real estate deal. I didn't know what points were. And fortunately, about a year earlier, I had the very good fortune to be walking through Walden Books in Cerrito Small, and I picked up an audio cassette tape for $9.95 by Zig Ziglar, and it was called See You at the Top. And the subtitle was A Checkup from the Neck Up to eliminate stinking thinking and avoid hardening of the attitudes. You like Zig Ziglar? Any Zig Ziglar fans in here? Yeah, yeah, he's great. The late Zig Ziglar, he's, he's awesome. And I remember next to it, in the little tiny audiobook section, there was a cassette tape. Remember those? <laughs> okay. A cassette tape uh, called The Psychology of Winning by Dennis Waitley. Ten Qualities of a Total Winner. And I remember just totally agonizing, gosh, do I spend another $9.95 and get both of them? Well, fortunately, I got both of them. And the psychology of winning had this giant influence on my life. I listened to that cassette literally 180-ish times in the next 30 days because I would drive a lot. I, uh, I, in the time, I lived in L.A., and I would drive to Long Beach and I was listening to this cassette constantly to program my mind. And then I discovered Jim Rohn and Earl Nightingale, and later, of course, Tony Robbins. You know Tony Robbins is, right? You've heard of him? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> Live with passion. Right, and, it, and, and that just totally changed my life. So I got my real estate license my first year of college, and it, I was 19 years old. It was a couple weeks before my 20th birthday. And I started selling real estate to investors for Century 21, just so I could learn the business. Because I remember Earl Nightingale saying to me, if you want to get rich in real estate, learn the business first. Just be humble and learn the basics. And so I did that. And then one of my clients was a guy named Jim Wool. That was his name. And he had purchased a few properties from me as I drove him and other clients around in my little Volkswagen Jetta. And, uh, he came to me about six months after I was in the business, and he said, uh, you know, one of these properties I bought from you, it was a little one-bedroom condo in Huntington Beach, California, on Coventry Lane. He said, I don't really like this property. It's, it's just not one of the better ones. Why don't you take the listing and sell it for me, and then I'll buy a new, another property from you. And I said, you know what, Jim? I don't want to sell it for you. I want to buy it from you. And at 20 years old, that was my first rental property. I still lived at home, okay, but I bought my first rental property. And oddly, I had kind of a bad experience, to tell you the truth. You know, I had to evict my tenants. They were problematic and so forth. But I ended up selling the property and made some money on it. And then I bought a whole bunch more properties. And now I, uh, I've purchased a lot of single-family homes over the years, a uh, few apartment complexes. Um, a mo I just bought my first mobile home park uh, with a partner client of mine, about 200 units, and uh, I am officially a slumlord. Okay? Yes. <laughs> just kidding. Mobile home parks have awesome cash flow. But um, so my real estate career developed. I bought a uh, real estate company that was failing. It was in Irvine, California, as Matt said. And then uh, I sold it to Coldwell Banker, and that was a pretty tough deal to turn that company around. But I did it, I sold it, had a good exit. And then I got into the investment business because I thought, you know, why is it that income property is the most historically proven asset class in the world? It's the best investment vehicle, but it has 
frankly, a kind of a lousy sales force. It's just not a very good way that it's sold. It's sold all by local people uh, who only sell in one market. And I thought, why isn't there a Merrill Lynch of real estate investing? So I tried to invest my money from the sale of the company nationwide so I could be diversified, and I couldn't find any way to do this, anyone to help me with this, so I created this company that did it. And about a year into that, I heard Leo Laporte on KFI radio on a Saturday afternoon as I was driving on Jamboree Road in Newport Beach. Anybody ever listen to Leo Laporte, the tech guy? Yeah, he's great, all right? Anyway, so this guy calls in about podcasting, and I thought, that's really interesting, podcasting. And I was looking for ways to gain leverage. Remember, we're talking about leverage. How do you do more with less? right? Podcasting. I thought, that's really good. I had a little radio show on KRLA at the time. It was okay. My company was spending about a quarter million dollars a year on radio advertising. That was, you know, so-so. And I thought, I really need to be able to explain things to people deeply. So I started this podcast nine years ago. And I've been fortunate to interview all kinds of very famous guests on my show over the years. And um, that's just been a great thing for business. I've had uh, Ben Carson, presidential candidate. Steve Forbes has been on the show. I've, so I've had three presidential candidates, a bunch of just huge name guests. Uh, and it's been great to learn from these people and ask them the questions. And now. Uh, I've got this whole podcast network with a bunch of different shows. And um, podcasting is a really great way to reach an audience. Any podcasters in here by any chance? No. Wow, in this room full of awesome entrepreneurs, not a single podcaster. So, you know, if you're selling outside of Amazon, oh, there's one back there I just saw. Yay! All right. Um, so, if you're doing that and you're do to doing some of these outside of Amazon sales things that some people have talked about, you know, this might be something you want to consider. It's been a great thing for me. My podcast has earned about $12 million for me, and it's been awesome. And um, in terms of biology, because we're talking about leverage, I started another show called the Longevity and Biohacking Show. And that's been super interesting. Now, as, as amazing as it is to be alive at this era at this time in history, it does come with a few problems. And one of the problems that many people in our culture will have is too much life left at the end of the money. This is a giant problem because in interviewing some of the leading longevity researchers in the world on my show, like Aubrey de Grey, you may not have heard of him, but he's a, he's a big time longevity researcher. We are very likely on the verge of massive life extension. So everybody in this room is probably going to live a lot longer than they think. I mean, there are some amazing things going on right now, whether it be stem cell therapy, telomeres, uh, just incredible things. I mean, the kind of technology coming our way right now is nothing short of incredible. You know, most of you came from somewhere else for this conference, for the amazing summit and you had to pack a suitcase with different clothing, soon you can just wear one outfit and get on the plane or maybe the transporter room, who knows, and your clothing will clean itself, it will change colors, it will regulate temperature. It, I mean, just fabric will do that. It's incredible what is happening right now. So we can hack and leverage our biology in so many ways. Of course, the Fitbit was talked about earlier, and I've got my Fitbit on, and uh, this is part of the quantified self movement. Incredible data. Uh, I use an app for my iPhone called Sleep Cycle. I've been monitoring my sleep for about a year and a half. Very insightful when you start doing that for a while. Um, Muse, this is uh, something really interesting that I think Tim Ferriss is a fan of. And this literally will tell you what your brain is doing and tell you how to operate your brain in a more powerful way so you can change your states and control your states. I mean, and this is just a sample of a couple of things. I mean, there's so much. It's an amazing time to be alive. Would you be willing to take that as an affirmation? You know, when someone asks you, what time is it? or you think, what time is it? Instead of looking at your watch, now people might think you're a little nutty, say, it's an amazing time to be alive, right? What do you think of that? What time is it? 
it's an amazing time to be alive. Yeah, it really is. It really is. The opportunity has never been bigger. So in my last area of leverage, talking about investing, income property, the most historically proven asset class in the entire world, I've been saying that for a long time, and no one seems to argue with me on it. Nobody says, well, the stock market is better. My mutual fund outperformed your income property. Nobody says that to me. They always say, they agree, income property is the most historically proven asset class. And one of the reasons it is so powerful is that it offers leverage. Leverage in terms of doing less with more, in terms of financing. Now, many of you understand that already, but there are many other multi-dimensional aspects of this leverage, and I want to share with you just a couple of them today. So this is a, a performa. Now, I uh, created a course for Amazing, and I was honored to do it uh, when Jason and Matt asked me to. It's called Amazing Real Estate Investing. And uh, this is sort of a standard performa, and I know you can't necessarily see all those numbers on there. It's a big page. And these slides are available in PDF format through Amazing. So uh, you can look at it in more detail there. But this is a humble little single family home, and I believe it's in Orlando, Florida, or Orlando area in Florida. And uh, I'm going there for a property tour that I'm hosting next week. And here's what's interesting about it. Because income property is a multi-dimensional asset class, you might look at this property on the face of it and think, you know, Jason, this is no big deal. What's so great about this? You know, you can buy it for $109,000, and you can rent it for $1,050 per month. So what? It'll take about $32,000 with down payment and closing costs if you qualify for financing to acquire this property. And so what? You'll get a little return on your money. Big deal. But if you look in the section that's in bold there, and I can't really point to it here, unfortunately, for you, but um, you'll see that the overall return on investment is projected at 33, 33% annually on this property because it's a multi-dimensional asset class. And you earn your return, your ROI, your return on investment in so many forms, leverage, inflation, cash flow, appreciation, something we even call regression to replacement cost, where you buy these properties below the cost of actual construction. It's really an incredible asset class, it really is. And many of you have big problems here because of your success. And your problem is taxes. Taxes are the single largest expense in anybody's life. The single largest expense. And most people will spend all this time shopping around for a, a new car or trying to get a better deal on a, on a vacation or a TV set or something like that. And they've got this giant elephant in the room called the government, the taxes. And income property is the most tax-favored asset in America. And I know we have an international audience here, by the way. Um, so in terms of looking at the progression of our financial lives, we all start out usually as an employee or maybe even a self-employed person. And in that way, when, our income stop, when we stop working, our income stops. The next level is we become a business owner and we create a system that hopefully produces cash flow for us. And in so doing, we want to leave this system, and hopefully it works by itself. Now, I love entrepreneurship, and I'm a huge fan of owning your own business. But I'll tell you, businesses require attention. I mean, don't they? Even an Amazon business, which is probably one of the best businesses out there for sure, it requires attention because, you know, the past three days I've learned about, you know, hijackers and people that screw up your listings and do all this stuff. You've got to pay attention, right? So, you know, get involved in the next level, which is have some investments with fewer moving parts. When you look at a property, the laws and the customs that govern it have been around for thousands of years. You know, this concept of owning a property and renting it out to somebody is not a new idea by any means. It's been around for a long, long time. Now, let me just share with you an interesting article from the Wall Street Journal. The, uh, 
one of the mouthpieces for the vast Wall Street conspiracy. <laughs> okay, you didn't think that's funny. But anyway, I think Wall Street's a bit of a conspiracy. So here we go. So this article's interesting because it's the longest study I could ever find on property appreciation. And it was published back in 1996. And it tracks appreciation of real estate from 1926, before the Great Depression, way up to 1992. Yet oddly, the title of the article says, Dow Industrials, the Dow Jones, have been a wise investment decision. Let's take a look at this little graph here. So, the small cap stocks returned 12.5% over this period. Real estate returned 11% in terms of appreciation rate over this very long period, the longest study I could ever find on appreciation. The Dow Jones returned 11 or 10%, and then you have treasury bills and you know, inflation and so forth, okay? That's not important, but here's the thing that's really important. Rarely do people ever buy real estate without leverage. Now, what do I mean by leverage? Of course, I mean financing most of it, where you get a partner called a bank, where you put maybe 20% down on the property, and they pay for the other 80%. So that means you have a 5 to 1 leverage ratio. Why is it that we all know so many people who have become so wealthy owning income property, yet we really probably don't know anybody who started with a small amount of money and created great wealth in the stock market unless they were an insider, okay? And most of us probably aren't insiders. So when you leverage the real estate, when you take advantage of this powerful tool, where, like Archimedes said, give me a lever long enough and I shall move the entire world. When you take advantage of leverage, you take that 11% return that seems kind of modest. It even underperformed small cap stocks, only did 1% better than the Dow Jones. And you multiply times five. And you now have, just very simply, a 55% return on investment because you have a five to one leverage ratio. How many of you have ever, of course you've done this, you know, it's a sunny day, and you were in the sun, and you know, maybe your kids do this, or you did it when you were a kid, and, you, and the sun is behind you, and you see your shadow, and the shadow, and the sun's down low, and it casts a big shadow. This is like leverage. It's very powerful. You can be much bigger than you are. You can be five times bigger. You can do five times more than you can do with other asset classes. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, real estate's a great hedge against inflation. Sort of. I mean, it's not that great, to be honest with you, but people say that. It's an old saying in our business. And you'll notice that it only outperforms inflation by a small amount. But when you leverage it and you have inflation at, say, 3%, but you have a 5 to 1 leverage ratio, you're getting 15% not including cash flow, tax benefits, or something I want to introduce you to in a moment called inflation-induced debt destruction. Say that 10 times fast. Okay, stop. Inflation-induced debt destruction. <laughs> yeah, rubber buggy baby bumpers. <laughs> it's pretty hard. So, uh, so I have something I call my 10 commandments of successful investing. I just want to share a couple of them with you in the interest of time. One of the favorites of all my podcast listeners is commandment number three, and it is, thou shalt maintain control. It's interesting, uh, in our business life, we are very careful to make sure that we control our business and that we, we exert control. We don't relinquish control to other people as much as possible. You know, we want to know what's going on. We want to know what's happening. Yet, millions of people walk into Merrill Lynch or Ameriprise, and they relinquish control of their financial future to somebody else. We say be a direct investor. Be a direct investor so that you maintain control. i got to check a message here. Excuse me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> i got to read you something off my Kindle app in a moment. Uh, so maintain control. Now, when you relinquish control, you leave yourself susceptible to three 
problems. Number one, you might be investing with a crook. There's no shortage of Bernie Madoffs, there's no shortage of Dennis Kozlowski's, or all these crooks on Wall Street, the scandals are rampant. And it's true in real estate, too. When you invest in a fund or a, a, a pooled money asset, you know, someone else is in control. And they could be a crook. If they're not a crook, what if they're an idiot? Okay? If they're just stupid and you lose money because of their sheer stupidity, that's no good either. But let's assume they cross the first two hurdles. They're honest and they're competent. Well, the third problem is they take a huge management fee off the top for managing the deal. Now, how many of you uh, ever follow a guy named Lou Dobbs? You know, he was on CNN years ago, the Communist News Network. And uh, <laughs> it's funny, my mom says to me, I'm, I'm a big fan of Lou Dobbs, I like his stuff. And, uh, and she says to me, you know, Jason, Lou Dobbs is such a socialist, you really shouldn't follow his work. And I go, Mom, you went to Berkeley in the 60s. And you're talking to me about socialism. My mom's not a socialist either. But, but anyway, it's just kind of interesting because Lou Dobbs wrote this great book. It's called War on the Middle Class. I read it about 10 years ago. And in chapter two, Lou Dobbs says this about Wall Street. He says the standard rationalization for these astronomical salaries by CEOs, their boards of directors, and their consultants is that the CEOs are worth it because the companies they run benefit from their great leadership and they bring great value to their shareholders. How then do they explain that over the past five years, the CEOs of AT&T, Bell South, Hewlett Packard, Home Depot, Lucent, Merck, Pfizer, Safeway, Time Warner, Verizon, and Walmart were paid an aggregate of six, or sorry, of $865 million, and at the same time, their shareholders lost a total of $640 billion in value of their stock. Clearly, there is a disconnect here. It's not aligned with your interests. Now, there's one more example. Uh, Lou Dobbs goes on to say, he says, and then there's Larry Ellison, the founder and CEO of Oracle. From 2000 to 2002, this is in two years, Larry's personal take from the company was $781 million, Two years, almost a billion dollars, not bad. Yet at the same time, his shareholders lost 61%. And that's totally legal, folks. Completely legal, all of it. So maintain control. Now, commandment number five, thou shalt not gamble. Now, we're in Las Vegas, right? Who's gambling, right? And here we say this. But when it comes to real estate investing, you know, nothing special should have to happen for you to make a very nice return on your investment. We don't believe in speculation. We believe that the property must make sense the day you buy it or you don't buy it. What do I mean by making sense? Simple, cash flow. It has to cash flow from day one. Nothing special called appreciation should have to occur for you to make a nice return on your investment. Okay, and the typical metric we look for here, just so you know how you're doing, is at least 10 to 12 percent what's called cash on cash return. Of course, I talk about this in great detail in the amazing course. It's got about 40 videos in it. Uh, but uh, property must make sense from day one. No gambling. Thou shalt diversify, number six. Now, there's two great quotes on diversification. One is, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You've probably heard that one before, right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. The other one is by a man named Andrew Carnegie, and he said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. I don't really agree with either of these. I take kind of a middle ground. I say, outside of your business, of course your amazing business is one huge basket, that is creating income and wealth for you, and you want to take some of that income and invest it and make it work as powerfully as possible with leverage. And so I say take the most historically proven asset class, but diversify geographically, because there's an old saying in real estate that all real estate is local. All real estate is local. Number 10, 
thou shalt only invest in tax-favored assets. Income property is the most tax-favored asset in America. Taxes are the single largest expense in any of our lives. And let me just quickly explain something to you. Please pull out your smartphone, okay, because I need you to open your calculator app and help me out. So one of the huge wealth creators for income property investors is that they can dramatically lower or even zero out their tax bill. A few years back, I got this check from the IRS for $109,000. And that was because of something beautiful that Matt mentioned when he introduced me. It's called depreciation. And most people think, well, that doesn't sound good. I don't want it to depreciate. But here's the thing, it's like fuzzy math. Your property could be doubling in value, it could be producing positive cash flow, and because of this beautiful little thing called depreciation, the IRS could think that you're losing money. It's fuzzy math, I know, it's weird, but you know, the government has its ways. So here's the thing, when you buy a property, you can't consider it one thing, it's really two components. One is the land. The land, okay? So here's the land. And then the other one is the house or the apartment complex sitting on the land. Now, just like anything in your business, if in your amazing business uh, you buy computers or you spend money on advertising, you get a tax deduction for this stuff, right? Well, the IRS views your real estate investment as a tax uh, as a business expense also, uh, and this house can be depreciated on a schedule of 27.5 years. So let's say in this example, the land is worth $20,000, and this is a humble little piece of property, and the house is worth $100,000. Now, grab your calculator for me and help me out with this little math here. Take $100,000, the depreciable part of the investment, and divide by 27.5. Give me a number. 100,000. Someone louder. 3,000. 636. Okay, all right, good. So that, if you qualify, and by the way, I'm not a CPA or anything. You've got to talk to your CPA about this uh, for the details. But if you can qualify for these tax benefits, and there are ways that you possibly can, you get to take a $3,600 loss on this little property every year, even if it's going up in value and making money for you. It's an incredibly powerful thing, because if you can save on life's single largest expense, something that will probably take more than 40% of the wealth from you in your life, you can create wealth much faster. Okay, I got to hurry because I'm out of time here. Um, in the amazing course, I talk about the government entitlement mess and, you know, how the government is going to deal with this and so forth, but I believe they'll do it through something I call inflation-induced debt destruction. You know, they say that our government has made so many promises that it cannot possibly afford to keep. Between 60, and I had Lawrence Kutlikoff, the economist, on my show a couple of times, and 220 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars. And there's no way we can possibly pay for that. And the way the government is probably going to pay for it is they're going to inflate their way out of it. And that means that your dollar will be worth less money. Uh, and you might want to just take a quick note on this. Understand that to understand inflation, we need to understand the difference between nominal and real. So let me just grab something out of my wallet here. This is, can the camera zoom in on this? What is this I'm holding? It's a $20 bill, right? It's called a $20 bill today. What was it called 100 years ago? A $20 bill. Same thing, or maybe a silver note or whatever, you know. But it was still a, a $20 bill. The problem is that this $20 bill is worth only 4% of what it was worth 100 years ago. Now, with income property, inflation 
pays off our debt for us. Not only does our tenant pay our debt off, but inflation pays it off. And this is what's so incredibly exciting. See, the nominal, the name only of that is $20, but the real value keeps declining. Now, inflation is this insidious hidden tax that takes away our purchase, purchasing power. And it destroys the value of our savings, our stocks, our bonds, and thankfully, our debt our debt. And as we've been talking about leverage, we know that income property is the most debt-friendly asset. Raise your right hand and say, I love debt. <laughs> I love debt. Now listen, I don't love all debt. I don't have debt on most things, okay? I don't have any car debt. I just bought a new self-driving Tesla. God, that's so cool. I mean, the car drives itself. It's, uh, well, almost. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's really amazing. I love to not drive and just be chauffeured by a computer. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> but uh, hopefully it'll work out well. But uh, no consumer debt, just debt on the properties, investment-grade debt, three-decade-long fixed-rate, extremely inexpensive investment-grade debt. Now, I have something I call the ultimate investing equation, where we don't pay our own debts when it's in real estate. We outsource our debts to other people. How many of you like to outsource? Yeah. Well, with real estate, we outsource our debt to somebody. They're called a tenant. They pay our debts, and they usually pay us a little extra every month, too. It's a really great scenario that we've set up. Inflation is the most powerful method of wealth redistribution, and it redistributes wealth from lenders to borrowers and from old to young. Okay? So just understand that. Here's the last concept about inflation. Let me give you an example of it. Say, for example, you think, well, I went to this amazing summit, I learned all these amazing things, I'm going to grow my Amazon business, and that's going to be awesome, but I'm also going to take that money and I'm going to invest in income property. I'm going to do just what that Jason Hartman guy says. So you go out and you buy $1.2 million worth of property. And that'll cost you about $250,000 down in closing costs. And you do this, and the first month, you get all your mortgage statements, and you look at them, and you add them together. Maybe it's 10 properties, for example, like this 120,000 times 10. And you say, wow, this Hartman guy got me a million dollars into debt. I owe a million dollars in debt now. And then it's 2015, and then the years go by. And say, say for example, if you could do it, just for simplicity, you got an interest-only loan, interest-only financing on all of that, so no principal is paid down, even though in real life it would be, but for simplicity. Now, we go along, and we have uh, 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 25. It's 10 years later, and you look at all your mortgage statements again, and it still says you owe how much? $1 million, right? But... Ten years from now, do you think the value of that million dollars you owe will be higher or lower? It'll be lower. Because this is the hidden wealth creator with income property that I call inflation-induced debt destruction. Not only, hopefully, have you been getting tax benefits off that portfolio, not only, hopefully, have the tenants been paying down your mortgage, you've been getting positive cash flow and all of this great stuff, but inflation has also paid down your loan balance for you. Now, lest you think this is some esoteric theory, it happened to tens of millions of people in America already. In 1971, we went off something called the gold standard, and that allowed the government to spend money irresponsibly and to just spend, spend, spend. It was no longer tethered. They could just print money, create it out of thin air. And what happened after that is during the 70s, we saw this rampant inflation under Jimmy Carter and, uh, and so forth. And over the years, the person that got a three-decade-long fixed-rate mortgage in 1972, a year off we, after we went off the gold standard, they bought a home, they lived in it for free, for three decades, no rent, basically, the way this math works. And then... They looked it all, all up, and they noticed that the inflation rate over that period was just over 5% on average. And they realized that even though they borrowed the money at 7.37%, after inflation and tax benefits, 
not including living there for free for 30 years, they actually got paid to borrow that money. The net result was they got paid 1.16%. This is not a theory. It really happened to tens of millions of people who had mortgages over the past few decades. That's the power of inflation-induced debt destruction. Just one aspect of the multi-dimensional nature of income property. I always like to leave people with a couple of things. My listeners on my shows are always saying, what apps do you like? What books are you reading? So a couple things. This is totally miscellaneous, random. Um, I love Voxer. Now, Voxer gets a lot of crap from people. Sophia, who did this great job planning this event, she says, Voxer, so three years ago, Jason. <laughs> right? How many of you use this app? It is awesome. This is incredible. It has revolutionized my virtual companies over the past five months. I absolutely love it. Um, another little app I like is a fitness app called Tabata. It's a free app in the App Store. Voxer's free, too. And um, you can do these little, like if you, have, if you don't have time to work out, you can at least get a four-minute workout in every day, and you will feel awesome if you do four minutes in the morning. Of course, it's better to do more. Two great books I've recently read, Sapiens, the, A Brief History of the Human Race, phenomenal book, and then The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer, if you, you like Michael Singer, yeah? Okay, isn't that an incredible book? Yeah, I, I liked it, so I got the audio version. I'm on my fourth time <laughs> now going through it. It is phenomenal. So I just want to say thank you so much. What time is it? Awesome. <laughs>